What is up, Real Women? So you may not know me. You may not recognize me. I am not um, a main speaker here for Real Women, but I'm very excited to be with you. My name is Faith Gill, and I'm on staff here. I am the Sherwood Campus Director, um, and I'm so excited to be with you. So a little bit about me. My husband uh, is also on staff here. His name is Brady, and we have been married for four years. I got in trouble for not knowing this information like three and a half, three, three quarters, whatever. Um, and we have two kids. We have a 14 month old daughter named Navy and she is so cute. She knows all the words now. She loves making animal noises. So, um, our favorite animal noise right now is probably a sheep. Um, she loves saying bah and she also loves food and her favorite food right now is probably a Nana, which is actually a banana. But um, she's so cute, and I love just seeing her grow up. Seeing her grow up in the church is so fun. Um, we also have a six-week-old. So our son, his name is Malachi, and he is about six weeks old. And uh, he came uh, as a little bit of a surprise because we, first of all, did not expect to get pregnant with him. That's a whole story in of itself. And then um, I had some preeclampsia problems and had him a few weeks early. So we have been just in a crazy spin of life. But I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited to share a little bit about Jonah. If you have not read Jonah, I'm going to encourage you to jump in and read just the whole book. And that seems really long, but it's not. It's literally, I think in my Bible, it's a front and a back. In your Bible, it might be like two pages. Um, I'm going to encourage you to read it if you haven't yet, because we're jumping into chapter three and then next week we'll jump into chapter four and we'll be done. So jump in. I'm going to give you a little recap if you haven't read it, or maybe we just need to remember. Uh, Jonah chapter one, basically Jonah call is called by God um, to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want to do it. <laughs> he runs away as far as he can. He jumps on a boat and uh, God sends a storm. The storm is pretty major, like really major. And the people all freak out. Like, oh my gosh, you know, we're all going to die. Uh, who's done something to God? And, and Jonah's like, oh crap, it's me. I've, I screwed up. And they throw him overboard, right? He should, that should be the end of the story. He should drown. And then that's that. But God is gracious. And so in chapter two, Jonah is picked up by a whale. He's swallowed by a whale, a fish, whatever you want to say. Um, and at this point, he begins to just thank God for, the fact that he's not dead, that he's not drowning. Um, and so he has this moment with God. He talks with God. He works through some things with God. And then God throws him up on the shore of Nineveh. And that is kind of where we're going to take up on chapter three. But I want to ask you a question. Have you ever missed out on an opportunity, like a once in a lifetime chance? Maybe it was a job you passed up. Maybe it was a vacation. Um, maybe it was a, a car that you had a really good deal on that you could have made some money somewhere, um, a career. Maybe you passed up going to school, finishing school, you know, whatever that looks like. Uh, maybe you passed up a love of your life. It just didn't work out. wasn't the right timing. If you're currently married, maybe not confess that, especially if that's not the person that is, uh, the person that you believe is the love of your life. Um, but no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, we pass up on opportunities. And actually, I had that experience in my life many a times, obviously. But one of the times was when I graduated high school. I had spent a lot of time um, thinking about whether I should go into ministry or what I should do with my life next. And really, I ran. Uh, God told me I was supposed to be in ministry. And I was like, hmm. No, I don't want to do that. I want to just do something different, something I'd never experienced. Uh, my parents are both in ministry. I grew up in ministry and I loved ministry. I, I don't see it negatively. I just want to do something different. So I decided instead to run and um, I passed up that once in a lifetime opportunity. But thankfully, um, because you just heard that I'm in ministry now, thankfully, God gives more than one once in a lifetime chance. And so that's actually point number one. God gives more than one once in a lifetime chance. So I want you to go ahead and write that down, put it in your notes. Um, but I want to add to it in parentheses sometimes. 
sometimes. Because at some point, these second chances run out. So we can't just go around acting like, oh my gosh, these chances will just come up all the time. I'm going to pass this one up, but I'll get another one. Because it may not work out that way. But in this particular story, chapter three is all about Jonah's second chance to follow God's mission. So in Jonah 3, 1, it says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This is kind of crazy because if you think about it, when God comes to Jonah, if you've read Jonah 1 or if you were listening to Jonah 1, when God comes to Jonah, Jonah knows exactly what God is saying. Jonah's a prophet for crying out loud. He knows exactly what God is saying. He should be obedient to him, but yet he's not. He's not obedient to him. And if I were being honest, I would pass Jonah up and be like, all right, well, you passed up my opportunity and I'm going to go find somebody else. You know, if I were dealing with somebody in, in my life and I really needed them to do something and they ran away like that, I would have just passed them up. But the beautiful thing is God comes a second time because he doesn't give up on us as much as we give up on ourselves and others. God is a God of grace and he's a God that calls us back into mission with him. A lot of times what we do, especially in the church world, is we see ourselves as spectators, right? We sit in the crowd and we watch other people serve. We sit in the crowd and we watch other people give. We sit in the crowd and we watch other people um, do what God's called them to do. And we just, we sit there and we spectate. It's like a baseball game. We go and we get our popcorn and we sit down in our seat and we just watch, Right, We see someone else doing something with incredible faith, feeding the hungry and doing the things, uh, passing up jobs that are really big jobs so they can serve God more, um, things like that. And we're just like, oh, that's great. And we spectate. But you know, God has called each one of us to change the world. God has called each one of us to be a part of the church. So tonight, today, God may be coming to you a second time. And he might be giving you the opportunity to take on those once in a lifetime chances you've been turning down to be on mission with him. And I hear a lot, especially in church work. Um, well, you know, I, I had the chance to do this. I had the opportunity. Well, I, I could have served in the church, but you know, uh, my kids were little and it just wasn't a good time. And now I feel like I've passed it up. I've, I've lost my opportunity. It's not true. God looks at time so differently than us. He looks at time so differently than the way that we see it. He is not in a rush. He is writing a story and orchestrating it, and there is lots of time in between. And so the story I think of when I think about time and how, how God orchestrates things differently than what we think about time is the story of Sarah and Abraham. If you don't know the story, Sarah and Abraham are barren, which means they can't have children. And she desperately wants a child, but she can't have one. And God tells them, you're going to get pregnant. Now, Sarah's quite old. Sarah is um, a grandmother. It would be like, you know, your your grandmother, your very old grandmother um, getting pregnant and surprising you with a baby bump for Mother's Day or for your birthday or whatever. It would, it's different. It's weird. And it shouldn't have been able to happen. But guess what? God doesn't see time like us. And he gives Sarah a baby. He grants her her request. He gives her her once in a lifetime um, chance. And he answers her prayers. We serve a God that raises people from the dead. Think about Lazarus. That heals the blind. That gives a salvation. That sends his son for salvation. Gives Sarah a baby when she is so old. So old. And a God that gives second chances. So we can't just discredit and go, well, I passed up on my opportunity. No. Because our God is a God of second chances. But God expects us not to be a spectator. He's not giving us a second chance so we can go run around and do whatever we want. He's giving us a second chance so we can step off the sidelines and do something. And you see this in Jonah 3.3. 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Jonah obeyed the word 
of the Lord. Isn't it an incredible thing to be obedient to the Lord? We don't give enough credit to how hard that is, to how much work it is. And actually, we're going to talk about that in just a second. It's a lot of work to be obedient to the Lord, right? I mean, we have our own agenda. We have our own thing. We have our own way. And our hands are, we're closed. We're clenched in a position where we want what we want when we want it. We have our mind made up about things. We have an agenda. Um, We have things we're not willing to give up and our hands are clenched. And being obedient to the Lord requires us to open our hands, to let go of our control, to let go of our own plan, to trust, right? And so point two is to go, you must let go. To go, you have to open your hands and you have to let go. Jonah had to let go of a lot of things in order to follow God's mission. A lot of things. And let's let's go through some things that he had to let go of. He let go of sin. Sin. One of the main reasons why I struggled to want to go into ministry was because ministry was hard. And I was selfish. I was sinful. I struggled with wanting to always be here and to give up um, doing my own thing, to give up uh, money, to give up whatever I thought I was going to gain from not being in ministry. Sin. Maybe you struggle with cussing. Maybe you struggle with living with somebody before you're married. Maybe you struggle with selfishness. You're just not willing to let go of um, money. Maybe you're serving money. That's a sin. So sin, he had to let go of sin. He had to let go of his career. You know, we're so often set in that, oh, we're going to take this career change. We're going to do this, this, and this. We're going to have this plan and this life and this agenda. And I am going to just worship this job because it pays me. It pays the bills, right? Sometimes we have to let go of my career plans, of my future, let go of insecurity. I'm horrified of failure. I hate failing, hate it. Maybe for you, it's I'm insecure about my body. I'm insecure about speaking. Uh, When Brady and I first got married and uh, he decided he wanted to go to ministry, that's the first thing he said is I'm not speaking. I'm not comfortable speaking. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not speaking. And now look at him today. He had to release an insecurity to let go of it because God was like, no, I have a plan for you. If you will trust me, if you'll let go, I will bring you into a beautiful plan you could have never seen for yourself. So if you haven't seen, um, my husband speaks on Sundays. My husband speaks on Wednesdays. And although he may not be always like super excited and confident. That might not be what he knows he's best at. I believe he's great at it, but he does it and he trusts the Lord and God has brought salvations through his message. God has brought life change through his message. And that is just testament that you have got to let go of insecurities. Fear. Jonah was afraid. Jonah was afraid. And he had great reason. So if you don't know anything about the Ninevites, the Ninevites were scary people. (laughs) They were scary people. Um, The Ninevites killed for sport. They were um, incredibly strong people, and they kind of set the tone for every other city. Um, So they would cut people's heads off, and they would put them on posts and put them outside of the city just to let people know why they should be afraid. And Jonah's about to go tell those people to repent fear. He's afraid. His safety, he had to let go of it. His plan, his agenda, whatever he thought he was going to be doing over the next year, whatever um, his idea was, he had to let go of it. And then finally, his hatred. A lot of times what God calls us to requires us to forgive someone, to let go of something. 
um, that they've done to let go of something that they that has that has hurt us in order to follow God's mission. And so he had to let go of some hatred for these people. I mean, they're awful people. They've killed people. They don't deserve to be changed. They don't deserve to see life change. And that very well probably crossed his mind. Your enemy is so good at trapping you in these things. And what it does is it keeps you outside of God's mission. But we have to move past that. We have to let go. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need a savior. We've got to let go and we've got to move past them. We've got to stop listening to Satan. I hear so much, so often, so, so often people will say, well, I screwed up. I mean, what will people think if I preach the word of God when I did this or I've done that or I've lived this way? Well, think about it the opposite way. Everybody has messed up. Everybody screws up. So imagine if you are like, I was wrong. I'm repenting. I'm turning away. And here's what God's taught me. I'm serving on God's mission. I'm being his child and I'm accurately living it out in my life. I'm not perfect, but I work towards it. Think about the testament that tells someone else because they're screwed up too. And they look at you and they go, well, if she can do it, I can do it. We're so quick to think about the most negative parts. But what about how inspiring it is to see somebody that is like me, that's screwed up, that's not perfect. Come and say, I'm not perfect, but I'm going to live on God's mission. Jonah was a prophet and he ran away from God. But he comes back and he lets go and he works with God and then he begins to do what God says. And it says, um, Jonah 3, 4 says, on the first day, Jonah started into the city. And started means to be loosened from one thing to go to another. To be loosened from one thing to go to another. Jonah is letting go of the fear and the anxiety and the worry and the hatred and the plans and the agenda. And he is moving into and starting on a new path. And here's what's crazy. Jonah walks a full day's worth into the city before he begins preaching. There's absolutely no escape for him. No escape for Jonah. And he does this on purpose because he begins believing God changes things. So point three, he begins believing God changes things. Jonah 3, 4 says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Jonah comes in with this big message, with this really big message. And he says, repent, turn to God, or you're going to be destroyed. You have 40 days. I don't know about you. I'm just going to be completely honest. If I were Jonah and I knew that these people were like professional, awful killers, people that did not care about anyone and only their own agenda, I might bring my own Joel Olstein message in there, right? Like, um, get rich. You're going to get rich. You're going to be wealthy. Please don't kill me. <laughs> uh, life is going to be easier for you. Please don't kill me, right? Every day is Friday. Um, you're going to be rewarded. You're going to be blessed. That's the kind of message I might be tempted to bring in, but he doesn't. Jonah 3, 4 again says 40 days, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And listen to this, Jonah 3, 5, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. The people repented. Jonah brought in this hardcore story and the people repented. Jonah 3, 6, 6 says, when the news had reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth and sat in the dust. Now, this is a king that's incredibly full of himself. He believes highly in himself. He thinks greatly of himself. And he would be the type of person that, you know, if you tell him that someone else is going to come in and destroy his city, he'd probably be like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I run this city. You know how arrogant men get. Um, but no, he didn't. He humbled himself. He changed. And you want to know why? 
because God's word is so effective to change you and to change me. And this is really crazy. This is like Snoop Dogg doing a Bible study. Okay, this is like Kim Kardashian or Miley Cyrus speaking on abstinence. That's how big this change is. And it's going to completely disrupt and change the city. So Jonah 3, 7 through 8 says, Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast, beast be covered in sackcloth let everyone urgently call on god let everyone urgently call on god they realized the life they were living was wrong and that everything had to change when was the last time you took an honest interview of your life And you're willing to dig into it and say, God, whatever is in me, whatever shouldn't be there, point it out to me. I'm going to turn away from it. I'm going to change. I'm going to begin to walk towards it if I should be. My husband is really obsessed with uh, a clean house. (laughs) He really likes his house being clean. And I kind of get into like a, a rut sometimes. I may not be the cleanest of the two of us. And so I get into a rut sometimes and I'm like, oh, I don't even notice, uh, you know, the house being dirty. I don't notice the floors being a little bit messy. And we have two young kids, so the house is always a little bit messy. And I, I, I begin to not notice those things, right? But the moment you tell me someone's coming over, me and Brady both are like, <gasps> like we begin to have eyes to see how messy our house is. Right. Oh my gosh. You see the trashes are full and you never notice that the the sink is disgusting and there's toothpaste everywhere. And you begin to see all of these things that you had been missing. That mess in your life without honest evaluation with you and God, you might be missing it. It may not be bothering you. You've gotten used to it. This past week, my kids have been sick and my parents have been gone on a mission trip. And so I've been responsible for my children by myself. (laughs) And it's been kind of a crazy week because they've been sick too. And so I have drank Dr. Pepper after Dr. Pepper after Dr. Pepper to keep me awake, right? And I didn't realize how many I had drank until I came to the pack of 35 Dr. Peppers and over half of it is gone. Guys, I've had like two to three Dr. Peppers a day for the last seven days. But I didn't even notice until I looked at the package as a whole, until I began to evaluate the packaging and count it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have drank that much Dr. Pepper. What are you watching? What are you looking at? What are you taking in? What are you seeing on social media? What are you talking about? Uh, What are you seeing that doesn't even bother anymore what are you not doing are you coming to church on Sundays are you serving in the church are you giving to the church what are you not paying attention to and what are you not changing what needs to change in your life Nineveh looked at their their city they evaluated and said something has to change And the beautiful thing is Jonah 3.10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. God came to Jonah a second time. Jonah changed. And because of that, the people heard the message of Christ and were saved. They were saved. He saved a whole city. Because of his message, if he he had not preached the message, the people wouldn't have come to receive repentance. When God comes to you a second time tonight, change. When was the last time you asked God to reveal to you, God, what once in a lifetime opportunity, once in a lifetime chance am I passing up? Second to that, God What are the things in my life I need to remove 
in order to take up that once in a lifetime opportunity? And third, do I really believe that you have the ability to change things in my life? And so those are the three things I'm going to encourage you. This is a, this is a Bible study. Like we've, we've been going through it. So I'm going to encourage you take those three questions home, take home the study on Jonah and mix them together and really begin to pray journal, get a journal, get a piece of paper. If you don't have a journal and begin to write down those questions and begin to fill them in and really let God evaluate your life. Where are you and what do you need to change? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your families. I want to pray for your homes as you begin to change um, your life so you can change the world. So God, I just thank you that you care about us, that you want us to be on mission with you, that our desire to do what we want, God, is overshadowed by your desire and your, your, your mission for us. God, I pray that you'd pull us in, that we'd take an honest evaluation of our lives. We would let go of sin and shame and fear and our careers and our desires, God, and we would begin to follow you. And we believe that you can change things. You can heal things. You can mend things. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be your people and to um, see stories like Jonah that gives us inspiration. Um, God, we love you and we praise you. It's my pray. Amen.